Today on the Perception and Action Podcast, how much do we need to be able to see to act? If we intermittently take our eye off an approaching ball, will we still be able to catch it? Can we combine snapshots of a visual scene? Will learning to do this better make us a better athlete? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to dig into a research topic that has interested me for a long time, intermittent vision. Before I get into that, though, I want to tell you about an update to episode 56. In that episode, I talked about a study which manipulated movement variability by having basketball players shoot over bars of different heights. If you remember, they found no benefit of this type of constraints-based training. But I speculated that the bar might have occluded vision of the rim in some cases. Well, one of the authors of this paper, David Fizelli, was kind enough to contact me on Twitter and let me know that they actually used a very thin rod to prevent this issue. So that can be ruled out as a possible explanation for the lack of effect. Thanks for letting us know, David. I really appreciate it. Okay, on to today's topic. And if you think you don't know what you want now, just wait and see. Despite the common instruction to always keep your eye on the ball, in sports, there are multiple situations where an athlete temporarily has to take his or her eye off their target. For example, in baseball, outfielders sometimes have to look away from a fly ball to find the wall. Or, a soccer midfielder might switch glances between teammates they could pass the ball to. How does the control of action work in these situations where we're not continuously viewing a moving object? Or in other words, receiving intermittent visual input. How long and how often do we need to look at a moving object to be able to successfully act on it? My reason for digging into this topic now is actually that I've recently purchased two pieces of equipment that can be used to study intermittent vision. A pair of stroboscopic glasses designed for sports training and a new set of Play-Doh occlusion goggles made by Paul Milgram from the University of Toronto that have been frequently used in research. I'll be talking about this in detail later in the episode, but I also created a vlog in which I demonstrate both of these devices. This is meant to be a companion to this podcast episode, so please consider checking it out. Link in the show notes. The person who has done the most extensive research on this topic is Digby Elliott, who is an emeritus professor at both Liverpool John Moores University in the UK and McMaster University in Canada. Elliott's earliest studies in this area used a manual aiming task. Basically, a participant would be shown a target that they had to move their finger to. Then, the room lights would be turned off at different points, either before or during the movement. What was found in these studies? First, it was revealed that participants could only tolerate waiting in the dark for about two seconds before they began their movement. If you made them wait any longer than this, they started to make large pointing errors. This finding suggests that we have some sort of representation or visual memory of the target location that persists for about two seconds and then decays. Interestingly, this two-second number pops up all the time when you study human performance. For example, experienced drivers seem to look about two seconds ahead, and it is the maximum amount of time most people are comfortable taking their eyes off the road. So, basically, this study shows that when we take vision of our environment away, some useful information persists, but only for a very brief time. And this persisting information can be used to produce movements almost as good as when we have continuous vision. But what happens when vision is occluded during the movement? Again, we don't seem to need full continuous vision to perform well. Specifically, Elliot and colleagues found that receiving visual samples of your arm and the target as short as 20 milliseconds, once every 100 milliseconds, was enough to produce performance as good as when viewing everything continuously. But of course, this is pointing to a target just sitting there, not moving. Surely we need to be able to see more of the flight of a moving object to act on it.
To study intermittent vision with moving objects, Elliot and colleagues switched to studying the task of one-handed catching of tennis balls using the Play-Doh occlusion goggles. I've used this task myself and it's actually a bit harder than it sounds. You need to get the timing and position of your hand just right or you'll drop the ball. In their first study published in 1994, participants attempted to catch tennis balls launched from 8 to 12 meters away at a speed of about 30 miles per hour, while the glasses were opening and closing at different rates. Their basic finding was that as the frequency of the opening and closing of the lenses decreased, so the glasses were alternating more slowly, it became much harder to catch the ball successfully. This could be offset somewhat by making the time they stayed open a bit longer. However, the real critical factor was the interval between visual samples. Anything longer than about 80 milliseconds produced large catching errors. For intervals less than 80 milliseconds, catching success was about 85% of what was found in full vision, so pretty good. Elliot and colleagues took this as evidence that we can temporally integrate visual information about the time to arrival and direction of travel of the ball as long as they're fairly short interval between the samples of information. The next question they asked in a 1997 study was does it matter if the visual samples the catcher is receiving occur predictably or not? This issue is important because it can be used to tease apart two different ways the catcher might be determining the parameters of the ball flight. For example, its speed. One way this could be estimated is a basic computational approach. So for example, if I knew that the visual samples were occurring every 500 milliseconds, I could look at how far the ball traveled between intervals, then use the good old velocity equals distance over time formula, I could calculate speed. If I was doing this, randomly changing the interval between visual samples should mess me up, because I won't know what denominator to use in the velocity formula. The other way I could get speed, which is consistent with a more ecological approach, is of course just detect an information source that specifies it, like the ball's rate of expansion. If I'm directly perceiving information like this, and not doing a computation, a random change in the interval between samples shouldn't matter. So, in their study, Elliot and colleagues compared two conditions. A predictable one, in where catchers receive 20 millisecond samples, separated by 80 milliseconds, and an unpredictable one, where the samples were again 20 milliseconds in duration, but were separated by a randomly chosen interval that varied from trial to trial and was either 60, 80, or 100 milliseconds. What was found? The predictability of the visual samples had absolutely no effect on performance, supporting the direct pickup of information. Another really nice feature of the Play-Doh glasses that Elliot and colleagues took advantage of in a 1998 study is that you can control the opening and closing of the lens for each eye independently. In all the experiments I've talked about so far, viewing was binocular, in that the lenses for the two eyes opened and closed at the same time. In their 1998 study, Elliot and colleagues compared this binocular condition to two new conditions. The first was a monocular alternating condition. So for example, the lens over the right eye always remained closed while the left eye opened and closed or vice versa. How does this compare to the case where both eyes are opening and closing together? First, under full vision conditions, catching was significantly worse, by about 20%, when one of the lenses of the glasses remained closed. This is not surprising because the depth and motion information provided by two eyes, which I discussed back in episode 5, is important for controlling the final movements of the fingers closing around the ball. What happens if we now introduce intermittent vision when trying to catch using only one eye open? The effect was quite striking. As the interval between samples increased, catching performance completely fell to pieces. For example, when the interval was 80 milliseconds, participants only caught 10% of the balls. Misses were found to be due to both positional and timing errors. By comparison, Increasing the interval between samples to 80 milliseconds under binocular viewing conditions had very little effect on performance, with people still catching 75 to 80 percent of the balls successfully. So, in a nutshell, making a precision catching action cannot be done very well with one eye closed, and furthermore, we don't seem to be able to temporally integrate visual samples from one eye very well. 
The second new condition that was added in the study involved interocular integration. That is, instead of having both lenses open and close at the same time, or only one eye open and close, they made it so the view alternated from one eye to the other. So left eye open, right eye closed, then right eye open, left eye closed, then left eye open, right eye closed, and so on. So, on the surface, this is very similar to the monocular condition I just talked about, which led to very poor performance. The catcher was still only able to see with one eye at a time, but the results were remarkably different. When the catcher's view alternated left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, they performed just as well as in the binocular condition, when both lenses were opening and closing together. And furthermore, they could tolerate long intervals between the eye's view, up to 100 milliseconds. This suggests that catchers were getting the binocular information they needed to catch the ball by integrating the two eyes' views across time. Pretty remarkable. In the final study by Elliot and colleagues I want to look at today, which was published in 2004, they looked at the effect of two different types of experience on the ability to catch under intermittent viewing conditions. The first type of experience they looked at was just general catching ability. To achieve this, they conducted a catching pretest, which involved attempting to catch 30 balls under full vision conditions. 15 skilled catchers, defined as those that caught over 90% of the balls, and 15 less skilled catchers, which were defined as those that caught between 60 and 70%, were identified and used in the study. The experiment involved the standard protocol, binocular viewing, so both lenses opening and closing together, 20 millisecond samples with increasing intervals between samples between 40 to 120 milliseconds. What was found? Although the skilled catchers did consistently better than the lesser skilled ones in the study, the effect of increasing the interval between samples was the same for both groups. That is, performance began to drop off sharply when the interval was 80 milliseconds or above, and the number of successful catches dropped by about one-third for each group when it was increased to 120 milliseconds. So it seems that being a better catcher does not make one better at integrating visual samples. The second type of experience they looked at in the study was training specifically on the intermittent catching task. To achieve this, 50 skilled catchers were split into five groups. Three of the groups practiced catching in an intermittent vision condition, one with a 120 millisecond interval between samples, one with an 80 millisecond interval, and one with a 40 millisecond interval. For all of these, the visual samples had a duration of 20 milliseconds. The fourth group practiced catching with full continuous vision, and the fifth group was a control group which didn't do any extra practice. The practice sessions consisted of four blocks of 20 catches, and there were 20 catch pre and post tests, which involved intermittent vision with an 80 millisecond interval. What was found? During practice, all three intermittent groups showed a significant increase in the number of catches, showing that we can get better at integrating visual samples with specific practice at it. In comparing the pre and post tests, all three intermittent vision training groups significantly improved increasing their catch percentage under intermittent vision with duration of 80 milliseconds from about 40 to 75%. There were no significant differences in the training effects for these three groups. The control and full vision groups both showed a small but non-significant improvement in catching performance from about 40 to 45%. The difference between the groups seemed to be due primarily to a reduction in the positional errors by the intermittent training groups. So what does all this tell us? First, we do get better with practice at catching under intermittent conditions. And second, it does not seem to matter what the specific intervals we practice with are. Continuing on with the topic of training with intermittent vision, I wanted to revisit a topic I discussed way back in episode 2, the idea that training under intermittent vision conditions may transfer to improved performance on the sports field. Note that in the Elliott and colleagues' studies I've been talking about, they were not really concerned with this question. 
Transfer refers to whether or not training under intermittent conditions improves performance under full vision conditions, which is not an effect they tested. In that previous episode, I reviewed some of the work that has been done, specifically a few studies by Stephen Mitroff and one that Luke Wilkins and I did. And I concluded that there really isn't any strong support for transfer effects from stroboscopic training. But it's still being used. In particular, the biggest proponent of it seems to be Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors. I posted a link in the show notes to show a video that shows how he trains with stroboscopic vision. But anyways, today I want to look at a new study that was published since my episode on vision training. One thing that hasn't been quantified very well in this area is exactly how stroboscopic glasses or intermittent vision affects sports performance outside of the catching test that Elliot and colleagues have used. I think this is crucial for understanding what the possible training benefits might be. In a recent study published in the journal Motor Control, Franson and colleagues looked at soccer dribbling in 189 youth players. Based on a pretest, they were split into three groups, fast, average, and slow dribblers. They then performed the Ghent University dribbling test, which involves dribbling a ball around a course. They did this under three conditions, a full vision control condition and two intermittent vision conditions that involve using the Nike Vapor strobe glasses. Now, as I mentioned back in episode two, there's an important difference between these glasses and the Play-Doh ones Elliot and colleagues used in their study. Namely, the Nike glasses do not completely occlude vision. You can still see through the lenses even when they're quote-unquote closed. The image will just be a lot darker. The Play-Doh glasses, on the other hand, completely occlude vision. This difference becomes evident when you look at the details of the strobe conditions used in the Franson study. The two conditions they used were an alternation frequency of 4 Hz, which equates to 100 millisecond samples separated by 150 millisecond intervals, and an alternation frequency of 1.33 Hz, which equates to 100 millisecond samples separated by 650 millisecond intervals. Remember, in Elliot and colleagues' studies, people couldn't handle intervals over about 120 milliseconds, never mind a 650. So this is the difference due to the glasses. It's a lot easier to use the Nike ones than the Play-Doh ones. But what was found in this dribbling study? Wearing the strobe glasses slowed dribbling performance for all three groups. But interestingly, they had the largest effect on the fastest dribblers. In the full vision control condition, on average, there was a three-second difference between the fast and slow groups. This was reduced to just over one second in the most difficult strobe condition. This suggests that the best dribblers in the study were more reliant on receiving fairly continuous visual information about the ball than the lesser skilled ones. This is a somewhat unexpected finding because in general, it's believed that more skilled performers become less reliant on visual feedback and can use information from other senses like touch, proprioception and kinesthesis more effectively. But the results of this study are hard to interpret because skill level is somewhat confounded with speed. For any level of skill, moving faster most likely relies on more visual feedback, so it would have been good to have conditions where players were asked to dribble at particular speeds to separate these two. But anyways, I hope to see more studies like this that look at the specific effects produced by performing sports skills with intermittent vision and how these effects might change with skill level. Okay, that's it for today's episode. I hope you found it at least intermittently interesting. Remember to check out the companion vlog I did for this, where I demo all the different conditions I talked about today. On my next episode, I'll look at body awareness and our kinesthetic sensitivity. Is it a key to success in sports? Can it be improved with training? Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or on Twitter at shakyweights. And to find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. If tears were liquor.